The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. We are talking about the visions of Ezekiel, understanding Ezekiel. And one of the things that just really struck me about it is Ezekiel's circumstances. Now, Ezekiel and Daniel were both in Babylon at the same time. We don't have any record that they ever met, but I suppose they could have known of one another. But Ezekiel, as a young man, the way the book starts, never having had anything like this ever happen to him before, he is in a refugee settlement sitting on the banks of the river Kibar. I don't know, perhaps he's staring out into dis- the distance. Perhaps he's reminiscing about the things that have come to pass that uprooted him from his land that did what probably many of the Israelites thought would never happen, that they lost their land. And so I'm sure it was a shocking experience. I, I can't imagine what it must have been like to leave the... the um atmosphere of being surrounded by Jewish people, some of whom were not behaving right, but people who thought the same way, who had a worldview, who had the same culture, and all of a sudden he's thrust into a pagan land. So he's on a riverbank, perhaps staring out into the distance, looking across the sandy plain, and then suddenly He is immersed in a vision with surround sound. And a whirlwind, a whirlwind is coming. It's in the sky. The heavens open. And he begins to see things and hear things and experience things. And I've seen a lot of things in the spirit, but I have never had an experience like Ezekiel had. Hearing the sound that sounded like a mighty rushing wind or an army. He had just heard an army come into Jerusalem. So a fierce wind is blowing. It's lit up with flashing fire and lightning. And he's seen strange sights and and symbolic images and I don't know if you've seen any of the pictures where artists have tried to render what Ezekiel saw but to be in the moment in that must have been an absolutely astounding experience he was 30 years of age and he's having what would be the first in a series of unforgettable experiences He feels the hand of God upon him because you see Ezekiel is beginning his ministry at this time. Ezekiel's vision, all his visions are rich in meaning. They're relevant. They were relevant for him at the time, of course, but they're relevant for us today. As you know, we've been meeting regularly and waiting on God to see what he would speak to us corporately as a group. And everything God gives, whether it's huge like Ezekiel's vision or a tiny word that the Lord gives, is priceless. It's it's precious. Dennis told me early on when we met that he treated every word 
that God gave him as a precious nugget of gold. And he says, if you cherish it, if you treasure it as something priceless, God will build on that. And we've seen in our meetings that God is building and God is taking us somewhere because God is never static. He is always moving. He's always leading. He's always guiding. He's always taking us someplace. Now, this message this morning has seven points that I'm going to cover. Number one, Ezekiel and the book of Revelation. Ezekiel and the book of Revelation. Most people study Revelation trying to figure out times and when things are going to happen, but both Ezekiel and the book of Revelation are very similar. And by the way, the book of Revelation is an unveiling of Jesus. And you'll get more out of it if you study it with that intent rather than trying to figure out current and future events. Number two is the three great chapters of Ezekiel. The three great chapters of Ezekiel. Number three are four sections with crucial points. Four sections with crucial points. Four, the beginning at the end. The beginning at the end. Five is whirlwind, cloud, fire, and glory. Whirlwind, cloud, fire, and glory. Number six, the living creatures of chapter one. The living creatures of chapter one and seven wings hands and feet wings hands and feet so one is ezekiel in the book of revelation two is the three great chapters of ezekiel three is four sections with crucial points four is the beginning at the end Five is whirlwind, cloud, fire, and glory. Six is living creatures of chapter one. And seven is wings, hands, and feet. The book of Ezekiel can be looked at as a miniature of the whole Bible. The whole Bible unveils a mysterious and beautiful story of God's plans and purposes. There is a mysterious story involving God and man that's unfolding in the universe. It has from the beginning and continues. It unfolds all through the Bible, and it's continuing to unfold today. This story tells us that God's desire is to become man's life. So human beings are infused with God's nature and bear his glorious image. The New Testament tells about us being conformed to the image of Jesus. When we're conformed to his image, we become expressions of God to the world. We are supposed to be expressions of God, expressions of his love, expressions of his holiness, expressions of his faithfulness. He wants to live his life through us. As we know in Galatians 2.20, it's so it's no longer I who live, but Messiah who lives in me to become living epistles that other people can read. One of the saddest um, stories I ever heard 
was Mahatma Gandhi once said that he loved the Jesus of the Bible, but when he looked around at the behavior of Christians, he didn't see the point of becoming a Christian. And so he never got saved because of people and their behavior. I remember when when I got saved, my older son was 12 years old, so took him to church and good worship. People raised their hands and, and praised God. And my son, after we'd met at, with, at this church for a few times, he came home and said, Mother, the, the people, the young people in the youth group raise their hands and act like they love God at church. But then when they're not at church, they act just like everybody else. My st- son is still not a believer to this day. Now, Mom's been praying all these years, and I'm sure that's going to change. But what an indictment on the role that we play in um, other people's faith. So, us being an expression of God. Now, the book of Genesis, the Bible itself, begins with the story of a garden, a tree, a river, and building materials on the banks of a river, the river, gold and pearls and precious stones. And at the very end, in the book of Revelation, the Bible ends with a temple, a tree, a river, and a city. The building materials are all built together. They were scattered loosely in the Garden of Eden, but now they're built together. So much of the Bible has the theme of life and building. As a matter of fact, God is building with us. It says he sets the solitary in families, and he um, speaks often about being in one accord. In Ephesians, it talks about us being joined together, bound together with the bonds of peace. And the word bonds there is, is actually the word for ligaments. Ligaments hold bones together. And bones are actually living stones. They're stones with life in them. And God wants us joined together in this body so we can function together as a living organism directed by the Spirit of God. That's one of the things in our evenings meeting together, how there is a, we're open to one another, we're open to God, and he gives a word to this one, to that one, to this one, and it all goes together, it connects together. It's like puzzle pieces that he actually causes to fit together on the evenings that we're here. Now this great mystery that God is doing is foremost a mystery between God and man. But we also know that it's man to God and man to man. God is really into relationship, relationship with him and our relationships with one another. Now, in the Bible, two particular books speak of this story in a similar way. Both Ezekiel and Revelation tell of God as life to man, speak of the spirit of life, and speak of a flowing river of life. The people of God having the likeness of God's glory and eventually becoming a place where God can dwell. Both books end with a vision of a city. Both books reveal that God's people are built and joined together for God's rest. God's enjoyment and to be a corporate companion and co-worker with God. Of course, I think it speaks most clearly in the Song of Solomon when at the end of the book, the Shulamite maiden speaking to her beloved says, let us go together into the vineyards. Let us go. Let us work together. That is the relationship that God is looking for so we will be in perfect sync with him 
So when it's on God's heart to do something, he will put it on our heart and we can work together. So Revelation and Ezekiel are parallels. They have a lot in common. The main points in both books are nearly the same. If you can get past the trumpets and the judgment and all that, um, Ezekiel and John the Apostle both saw visions. Both books begin with visions. In both, the visions are mainly related to life. In both books, they not only have the term life, but there are also visions portraying what life is, how life works within us, and among us. We can actually see something of life. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. That must be the reason God gives us visions and shows us things. And, and I'm, I'm a very visual person. I like to see pictures of things. And I am a, an old-fashioned paper map reader. And even when I'm going to someplace, I can't just listen to the GPS. I want to see on paper or on the computer screen, preferably on paper, where I'm going. I want to see what directions I will be going in. I need to have a picture in my mind. Okay, both of these books reveal the river of living water. In Ezekiel 47, a river flows out of the habitation of God. And also in Revelation 22, a river of living water proceeds out of the throne of God and the Lamb. Both of these books tell us how God's intention is to come into us to be our life so that we may share his divine nature and his glorious image. Then in his divine nature, with his glorious image, having him as our life, then having these things, then we're ready, we're prepared to be built up together as a habitation of God in the Spirit, Ephesians 2.22. You know, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the holy city of the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, and this is the bride's wife, and she has made herself ready. Dennis has been talking about the embroidered garment, that we get a garment of, white garment of justification when we're saved, but then... There is a wedding garment. There is a wedding garment. And this is spoken of in Psalm 45, which is the psalm of the royal wedding. And it talks about a garment of inwrought gold, an embroidered garment that is worked on by the Holy Spirit in us, stitch by stitch by stitch, step by step in our daily lives. And Dennis talked about how needlework is tiny little stitches, and it takes time. That's what God is working on with us. That is our preparation. So I encourage you to allow God to do his work in you. Now, both Revelation and Ezekiel have parallel comment, content. In Ezekiel, going through the entire book, we see visions of God. Revelation chapter 1, visions of God. We see the throne in the cherubim in chapter 1 of Ezekiel. In Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we see the vision of a new city in chapter 48 of Ezekiel. And in Revelation 21 and 22, we see a vision of the bride city, the new Jerusalem. And in the final chapters of both books, we see the river of God and trees of life that give life, that bring healing. So we see the life and the life supply, what we need to be ingesting, taking into us to have that life. Both books unveil parallel visions. And this is from chapter 1 in Ezekiel and chapter 4 in Revelation, we see opened heavens, we see a throne, we see a rainbow, we hear the voice of the Lord. Four living creatures in Ezekiel, 
I mean, four, four living creatures in both books, difference in the faces, four faces each. In Revelation, there's one face each with four different faces shown. The man, the eagle, the lion, and the ox. The cherubim, in Ezekiel's vision, that has four wings. The seraphim, in John's vision, has six wings. Why is there an extra set of wings? Well, we know, we'll talk about this later, but it says in the book of Ezekiel that there are wings for covering the body. That's a covering because we need to be covered to approach God and two wings for moving, for flying. Now, in both Revelation and Isaiah, where it talks about the seraphim, there are two additional wings for covering the face because God lives in unapproachable light. So we need the covering. And both books speak of the glory of the Lord. Ezekiel begins with the glory. Revelation ends with the glory. From Ezekiel, Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its mist like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire came the likeness of the four living creatures. But then in verse 28 it says, This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So if you want to know what the glory looks like this is a pretty good description and then in revelation it ends with the glory it says in revelation 22 23 the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it for the glory of god illuminated it or gave it light and by the way the cherubim in ezekiel represent god's glory the seraphim The name of the living creatures in Isaiah and Revelation, which means burning one or fiery one, represents God's holiness, his nature. So we have God's glory and his nature represented in these living creatures. Now, for the whole book of Ezekiel, guess what? We're not going to go verse by verse through all 48 chapters of Ezekiel. Um, just chapter one will be pretty much verse by verse, but we want to give an overview and a broad outline and a big picture to understand all the visions and the actions of Ezekiel. While Ezekiel was seeing this glory and this vision, he was experiencing this life. There's a principle. God doesn't show us things just so we will be informed. He doesn't just reveal things and say, sorry, you can't have it. What you see, you can have. What you see, it can be made an experience for you. What you see, you can experience. And that's what makes the Bible such a wonderful living book. To know that there aren't just doctrines and concepts in there, but everything points to something that we can experience. Toward the end of Ezekiel, Ezekiel saw a valley of dry bones that lived. He saw a huge house and a man who measured or judged that house. He saw a temple. He saw a life-giving river. All these are not to be just concepts or poetry. They're pointing to things we can experience this side of heaven, in this life. Ezekiel and Revelation reveal four different things in particular. Visions pertaining to life. We see God flowing out as life in Ezekiel and Revelation. He himself is our life. We come to him and know him, and he becomes 
our life. There's the tree of life, life, the fruit of life, and the life supply that God has provided for us. We see a flow of living water. And by the way, that river that flows, it has flowed from Genesis all the way to Revelation, and it's flowing now. It's just that not many people get into it and experience that flow. We actually, one of our books is flowing in the river of God's will that talks all about that flow. And another book on the supernatural power of peace. You know, until we get into these things and start studying them, we don't fully understand what God has prepared for us. We also see in both books visions of Jerusalem and both Ezekiel and the Apostle John are priests before God. You know, the apostles of the New Testament were God's high priests. Ezekiel 1 through 1 verse 3 says, The word of God came expressly to Ezekiel the priest. But better than this for us, it says in Revelation 5, 9 through 10, that Jesus redeemed us and made us kings and priests before God. So in the Old Testament, it was the prophets who could prophesy. Now in the New Testament, all may prophesy. Not all are prophets, but all may prophesy. We can all hear from God. We can all see visions. We can all enter into his life. Now, the three great chapters of Ezekiel. Although there are many similarities to the book of Revelation and there are different themes that are carried throughout the Bible, Ezekiel has three unique chapters. And in those unique chapters, there's revelation given that's not given any place else in the Bible. Each of these chapters can be described by a single word. Chapter 1, fire. Chapter 37, breath. Chapter 47, water. Chapter 1 is fire. No other chapter presents God as fire like this chapter. Moreover, the living creatures participate in God's fire. Chapters 33 through 37 leading up to chapter 37 on breath have a preparation for the breath. It describes how God recovers his people, how God prepares his people. Chapter 33, we learn that in the process of recovery, that a watchman is set. In chapter 34, the shepherd comes to seek his wandering flock and lead them back to where they belong. In 36, God restores his people outwardly as well as inwardly, making them clean and placing within them a new heart and a new spirit and giving them his own spirit. And then chapter 37. God breathing. Now we know that God breathed the breath of life into Adam, but what about a corporate breathing? In chapter 37, the Lord brings his dead and disconnected people back to life, makes them one, gives them life, and joins them together into one whole connected group of people. That's what God's breath can bring to pass when he breathes on his people. I think the whole church world needs the breathing of God in this way. No other book in the Bible, no other chapter in the Bible describes what effect God's breathing on his people can have. And then chapter 47, water. 
Now, other chapters in the Bible speak as John 4 and John 7 and Revelation 22 speak of water, but not in the way that Ezekiel speaks of water as a healing river, not just for God's people, but flowing out over the whole earth. You wonder what it's going to look like when the glory covers the earth as the waters cover the sea? Take a look at Ezekiel 47. Life will be given. People will come to life. People will conform to God. That would be great. That's what we're praying for for our nation. That God would get a hold of our nation and bring it back into conformity with him. Another great awakening. You know, in the history of the United States, the awakenings and the revivals are so unique. You know, this was, Israel was a covenant nation. God loved Israel and made a covenant with Israel. But as far as America, the people of America loved God and made a covenant with God because they loved him and wanted him. The French Huguenots, Huguenots in um, Port Carolyn, the first settlement in the nation and the pilgrims came over before they got off that boat they made a covenant with god they wanted this place this nation to be a dwelling place for god nations have destinies nations have a purpose and i know things look pretty messed up right now but god is going to bring to pass the destinies that he has purposed for the nations of the earth and we know that jesus said that eventually he will come to judge the nations and he will judge between sheep nations and goat nations. And I believe what we're going to see in the years ahead, we're going to see Jesus forming the sheep nations. The ones who refuse him will be the goat nations. But we know that the nations are going to stand before Jesus for judgment in the end time. Right now, I would say they're hardly a sheep nation at all. But we know that God keeps his word and he brings people's and nation's destinies to pass. So we are anticipating God showing up. And I want to tell you, if you really read the Old Testament, there's no mess that God can't fix. The God that had the sun stand still in the sky for a whole day and not go down for Joshua, if he can do that, what can't? he do i mean just because something looks impossible to us it doesn't mean our god can't do it and he's going to recover his church just like he was recovering the people in ezekiel and then through nehemiah and zerubbabel and the priest ezra what a work god did before He brought the Israelites back to the land of Israel. It's absolutely astounding what God did. For the first time, for the very first time, the nation of Israel covenanted together as a people to obey God's word, to know God's word, to put away the foreign husbands and wives they had married, and it was just it was a revival like no other revival in the history of Israel and all this in Ezekiel is leading up to that revival so the four sections in Ezekiel emphasizing crucial points the first section is chapter 1 a vision of the glory of god for his expression, by his expression, there's a sign language that um, to reveal. And so we will be, here's God with a, here we are, and we're revealing God, okay, to express God. A vision of the glory of God for his expression, his move, and his government. The first section tells of Ezekiel's glorious vision of God and shows us God in his glory 
working in transformed people. Those living creatures in chapter 1, not a wing is out of place. Not a, not a step is stepped in the wrong way. Transformed people perfectly aligned with God. The second section, you know, they have, they have some, of, some of the parts of the Bible that are not fun to read. They're God's judgments on the, on the nation and God's judging his people. I think a lot of people, when they read these books, skip those sections. Chapters 2 through 32. And in this wonderful vision, all of a sudden we see all this dirt. The section, second section, chapters 2 through 32, presents the judgment of God on those things, people, and nations that don't align with his holiness, righteousness, and glory. And in this section... He judges Israel, and there's some pretty horrible abominations that were taking place in Israel, and then he brings judgment on the nations. So it's interesting that God will use the nations to bring judgment on Israel, but then God will turn around and he will judge them for their actions against his people. The third section Chapters 33 through 39, God recovering his people through life. After the judgment comes the recovery. I believe we are in a time of, an, of unveiling evil, exposing evil like God did in the second section. But the purpose is not just to expose evil. It's so that God can do something about it. We have to see what's there before we appreciate when God comes in and judges and then recovers both the destiny of the nation and the church. 33 through 39 speak of God's recovery of a remnant of his people. He recovers a remnant and remembers his covenant of grace. And then shortly after this, he takes that remnant and he brings them back to their own land. And of course, we've seen in our lifetimes, after the great dispersal in A.D. 70, we saw Israel become a nation again. And I want to tell you, God is working in his land today. And some of the things that are, are going on is it's absolutely amazing. The things Sid Roth tells us about the, the meetings they're having over there with all unsaved Jews, maybe as many as a thousand unsaved Jews at a meeting. And he starts off by getting words of knowledge of physical healings and they start getting healed. And then he preaches a message and sometimes 80%, sometimes almost 100% will get up and come to the altar and receive the Messiah as their savior. This has never happened outside the ancient times in the Bible, mostly in the book of Acts, that God is removing their hard hearts, just like he does in a chapter of Ezekiel, and he's putting a new heart and a new spirit within his people. God is up to some big things if we ha only have eyes to see it. God recovering his people by life. That's when it really gets exciting to me. But it, we do need to know the things that God judges so he can quicken some of that to us. You know, like, well, you need to work on that too. So the fourth section is the vision of the holy building of God. And the man that we know is Jesus, because guess what? Jesus builds his church. And then the man, Jesus, with a, with a reed and a measuring line. He gathers his remnant into his dwelling place and builds them together 
into his holy temple. God takes his recovered people, unifies them, makes them into a house for God to dwell in, built together for a dwelling place of God in the, in the spirit, life, and then God building with that life. See, he can't build with our flesh. Jesus doesn't build with our flesh, but the life he's worked into us, the anointings he's worked intimate into us, that he can build with. That's something that's usable. That's something Jesus can put together. So Ezekiel begins with the appearance of the glory and ends with God's holy building. Of course, that tells us that God's ultimate goal is building. And this is very surprising. This is unique in the entire Bible. The book of Ezekiel begins with the end. Because you see, chapter 1 is the kind of believers, the overcomers, that the building produces when it's built by Jesus and the glory is there. So, I want to just read you chapter 1, the most startling introduction to a book in the entire Bible. Ezekiel's first vision. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its mist like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. And also from within the fire came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another and the creatures did not turn when they went but each one went straight forward. As the, for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side. And each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces. Their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies. <clears throat> And each one went straight forward. They went wherever the Spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning, and the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their workings was like the color of beryl, which is like aquamarine, and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel, and when they moved, they went toward any one of four directions. They did not turn aside when they went. As for their rims, they were so high, they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. When the living creatures went, the wheels lifted up, went beside them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went. Because the, where the spirit, there the spirit went. And the wheels were lifted up together with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. 
When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. The likeness of the firmament over the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads, and under the firmament their wings spread out straight, one toward another. Each each one had two which covered one side, and each one had two which covered the other side of the body. When they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult like the noise of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads, and whenever they stood, they let down their wings. And above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne, an appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around it. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one speaking. What an amazing vision. What an amazing introduction to the supernatural working of God. You know, God made us for his glory. The low gospel, this most often preached gospel in the church, is the low gospel, the gospel of forgiveness of sins. God saved us for so much more than that. The high gospel stated succinctly in Hebrews 2 through 10 is that Jesus' purpose is ultimately being our captain or our pioneer, or our leader, bringing many sons to glory. We know that Romans 3.23 has both the low and the high gospel, for all have sinned. But it doesn't stop there. It says, and fall short of the glory of God. We were made to sit together with Jesus in heavenly places, it tells us in Ephesians that the rims of the wheels of the living creatures stretched all the way from heaven to earth. We sang this morning about God's kingdom coming. How does God's kingdom come on earth? Well, first God has to have people that are cooperating with him, like these living creatures, the overcomers. And as the wheel turns from heaven to touching earth, the glory and God's plans and purposes are released on earth. God needs co-workers who will cooperate with him to bring the kingdom of God on earth. Now, Ezekiel starts, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives by the river Kibar in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Now we know that when King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, took captives, that very few people were left in the land of Israel. He, t he left only the poorest of the poor there. It says all the... Um, the captains, the mighty men of valor, um, the craftsmen, the smiths, none remain except the poorest in the land. Second Kings 24, 10 through 16. And the king's mother, the king's wives, his officers, the mighty of the land, he carried away into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. All the valiant men, 7,000 and craftsmen and smiths, 1,000, all who were strong and fit for war. And we know that he separated Daniel and the other three Hebrew children from amongst the captives for special training. Now, first of all, Ezekiel was sitting by the river Kibar. There are two rivers in the book of Ezekiel. 
the river Kibar is the river of worldliness. Kibar means strong, many, and powerful. It refers to the power of the enemy afflicting God's people. It stands for the satanic floodwaters of the age, sweeping people away from God to Babylon. The river Kibar carries people away from God. It's the river of Babylon, the course of the fallen world. Notice that Ezekiel was by it, but not in it. The other river is the river of God, the waters of life, and ultimately waters to swim in. This river that flows out of the temple brings people into God's life. One river destroys the building of God, the other builds up the place of God's dwelling. And it's possible for a believer to have a mixture of waters. What do you have when you have a mixture of water? You have salty and fresh water mixed. Water that gives death. Ultimately, you have your dead sea, which is all salt. Brackish water is water that's more salty than fresh water, but not as salty as seawater. Brackish water cannot sustain life. There's some fish who have adapted to live in it, but if we drank brackish water, we would eventually die of dehydration because our kidneys would work over time and it would have to deal with that. It says to get rid of the excess salt, take it in by drinking salty water. You have to urinate more water than you drank. Eventually, you die of dehydration even as you become thirstier. God wants us to step out of the trends of the world. Mixture in God's people is not good. God's looking for a remnant to fully belong to him. Ezekiel the person. The name Ezekiel means strength of God. And I really think for all the prophets in the Old Testament, they all needed the strength of God to do what they did. The year was around 593 B.C. And the river Kibar was a man-made canal that branched off the river Euphrates and later rejoined it. The exile's home, Jerusalem, was 500 miles away. Now, Ezekiel was a priest. His father had served as a priest in the temple in Israel. The throne in Jerusalem had a puppet king installed on it. King Jehoiachin was carried to Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar put a puppet king on the throne. So it was a source of shame to the people. So a puppet and a wicked man. For someone like Ezekiel, this must have seemed like the darkest of times, at least until he had that vision. I don't think it would be very dark after that. As a priest, he lived in the presence of God and he ministered to God. But a priest is not just for God. A priest also ministers out to the people. Ezekiel must not have been living in a casual way to have received visions like these. He took God seriously, and God is looking for people who will take him seriously. He stayed so close to God that he saw the heavens opened and saw visions of God. And today we are called to be part of a royal priesthood. The visions began, and it says, in Ezekiel's 30th year. That's referring to Ezekiel's age. He was 30 years old. A priest comes of age at 30. 30 represents maturity. God prepares us in maturity before he can share his secrets with us. Now, this was the fifth year of captivity. So Ezekiel was 25 when he came to Babylon. Now, the priesthood requires a five-year apprenticeship. So the first five years that Ezekiel was in Babylon... He was in his time of apprenticeship to become a priest. Ezekiel first saw visions when he was 30. And by the way, Jesus began his ministry at age 30. The place was Chaldea, and Chaldea was not a good place. It was a place where the Tower of Babel had been built. It's the place where Satan instigated a great rebellion against God. It was the place out of which 
God called Abraham so that he might have a chosen people. And here is Ezekiel right back in that same place. But God had a people and he was working. The conditions for seeing the visions, it says the heavens were opened. The heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. The opening of the heavens takes place at a time of special visitation of God. We need to be the Ezekiels of today and draw so close to God that the heavens will open for us. Next, a vision was received. Something was revealed to Ezekiel. God's visions are special unveilings to enable us to see divine, spiritual, heavenly things. As we mentioned before, never, never diminish what God is sharing with you. Even if it's not as dramatic as Ezekiel's vision, it's precious. It's a tremendous thing. Then the word of God came expressly to Ezekiel. The Lord also gave Ezekiel his words. Visions are revelations. Words are explanations. God's words enable us to proclaim and explain to others what we have seen. Most of what we see, God has a purpose for us sharing it. Or God will build it into something, put the puzzle pieces together that we will eventually share. God is a great communicator. The word of God will come expressly to us when God explains what we have seen. And it says the hand of God was upon him there. God's hand is upon us for leading, guiding, taking action. Visions are for revelation. Words are for explanation. And God's hand is for leading, guiding, and directing us. We pay a price when God's hand is on us. That price is our obedience to him. Now we know from the nights when we're meeting together and sharing that God is putting his finger on different things in our lives, that he's working in us. See, God will work in us inwardly before he works through us outwardly. And so this is really a time for all of us and those who are connected with us, who are, who are out there in um, USA and Canada and around the world, the ones who are part of the school, the people who really follow full stature, um, the same is true of you. God is working with you and he's connected you with us for a reason. And he is going to bring something out of this. We've seen a lot of puzzle pieces. I don't know eventually where God is leading us, but it's clear that he is leading us, that he's guiding us, and that he's directing us. And one of the reasons that I thought it was important to have um, our nights together recorded, because we forget so much. Um, one of the things that I did, I knew it was special when Dennis and I got married. I just wrote down 12 pages of dates and this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened and 10 years later it became one of our first books so recording what you get from God keeping a record is very very important so Lord we thank you that you are making of us a people of people like Ezekiel today we're your little Ezekiel's for today. And Lord, we thank you for showing us things, for working in us. Lord, we pray that you will make us a cooperative and obedient people. And Lord, we're speaking today as a remnant, and we're saying yes to your voice. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.